In 1995, Princess Diana took one of the biggest risks any public figure can ever take. Your Royal Highness, how prepared were you for the pressures that came with marrying into the royal family? At the age of 19, you always think you're prepared for everything. As I watched it, I was absolutely aware that this is an extraordinary piece of television and practically every sentence was staggering. This no holds barred interview forever shattered the fairy tale image of one of the world's most famous women. It was like a bomb had been set off in the middle of the royal family. Yet for decades, the inside story of the interview has remained a mystery. Martin Bashir has cloaked the entire interview in this incredible drama. It was like something out of John le Carre. Now it's time to hear from the BBC insiders, investigative journalists, and those closest to Diana to discover why the princess chose to give this extraordinary interview. There was that feeling that she believed she was being watched by MI5 and she might ultimately be targeted. We'll ask if Diana was more in control than anyone suspected. The princess told me that she was coached by Martin. How to answer the questions. And discover how the interview transformed not only Diana's own life, but the culture of Britain itself. You are finally seeing a modern woman of the 20th century speaking up for herself. As well as lighting the fuse for tragedy. Press attention when stratospheric. <laughs> It was just snowballed. You kind of got the feeling that, where is this going to end? The princess had begun the day with a visit to a West London gym. She seemed in jaunty mood, unperturbed by the storm over her interview, a storm which has created even more interest in her than usual. I think she's a foolish girl to do it now because she doesn't need to. She came across as... Uh, a sad young woman in many ways, confused, very confused. I'd like to be a queen of people's hearts, in people's hearts, but I don't see myself being queen of this country. I saw the princess a year later, actually, after Panorama, and she said to me, I should never have said queen of hearts. I, did, I didn't mean that. That came out as trite. I think she's clearly thought through uh, precisely what the consequences of many of the things that she said would be. I don't think that's true. I think she was absolutely aware of what she was doing. She came into the royal family as this, this weak, little, gorgeous, blushing teenage bride. But she grew and she came out the other end pretty strong. And I think Panorama was a manifestation of that. This was a very calculated decision by Diana to put her side of the story out. Clever Diana. Do you think... The explosion of Panorama was the result of frustrations that had been building in Diana for more than a decade. <laughs> to understand how the fuse for the interview was lit, we have to return to one of her very first appearances on camera. At three o'clock, Prince Charles and Lady Diana appeared for the first time in public. And this was the first chance to see the ring of sapphires and diamonds. At the time, Diana's engagement interview was seen as the beginning of her star casting as a fairy tale princess. Um, I don't know what you thought of me. Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> seen through the lens of Panorama, however, this familiar footage takes on a very different light. Lady Diana's father described her this morning as uh, he said he thought she'd make a very good housewife. Oh, I thought <laughs> <he> said that. <laughs> <laughs> We've yet to see. <laughs> Good. Level's fine. Speed one. I'm Padisha, and I'm a filmmaker and a journalist. When I see early interviews with Diana, I see an intelligent woman who's struggling with her role and also struggling against the sheer smirking contempt of many of the interviewers. And I'm, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> well, it if you're a woman watching that, you're like, red flag, red flag, <laughs> run like the wind. <laughs> I am Dickie Arbiter, former Buckingham Palace spokesman, now royal commentator. I think for the Prince of Wales, it was a bit embarrassing uh, to say uh, um, 
yes, I am in love. So you can't fault the man for uh, saying what he did say, uh, given that they're not brought up to express emotions. No, it turned out he was having a full-blown love affair with someone else, so... By the mid-1980s, Charles's affair with Camilla Parker Bowles was an open secret. Throughout the decade, however, television documentaries such as those hosted by Alistair Burnett kept alive the fantasy of a fairy tale couple. Yes, four hands, two princes, and a piano. It's a photo session at Kensington Palace with the Prince and Princess of Wales and family. My name is Richard Kay, and for many years I was the royal correspondent of the Mail. During the crucial period of, of the Diana years, I wrote about her a great deal, and um, in time we became friends. It sort of showed quite what royal documentary at that time was like. It was, it was on all four knees and very uh, deferential. It was kind of reminiscent of something you might have got from the 1950s. What do you feel your role is? What is your contribution? <laughs> I feel my role is supporting my husband um, whenever I can, and always being behind him, encouraging, and also, most important thing, being a mother and a wife. For Diana, the enduring national fantasy of a dutiful wife was fast becoming a trap. And in June 1992, she made her first attempt to break free. There are now just 24 hours to go before the book which claims to expose serious rifts in her marriage goes on sale. By working with writer Andrew Morton via an intermediary, Diana kept secret her own involvement in this expose of her marital misery. Yet with suspicions of her complicity on the book running high, the palace remained furious. The Queen's belief is that you shouldn't show public emotion because you are the monarchy, you should be above that. Far from freeing Diana, the Morton book merely tightened her chains. She expected the Andrew Morton book to rescue her. It didn't, because the royal family put down the shutters. From 1992, Diana lived alone at Kensington Palace, separated but not divorced. With all media engagements now fiercely screened by the palace, she seemed trapped in a royal limbo. Yet it was a move by her husband that gave her an idea for how to break the deadlock. Well, I think the main motivator for her doing uh, the Panorama interview was Charles's interview with Jonathan Dimbleby the previous year. Diana had been quite impressed by that interview. It is, of course, remembered solely for, for one uh, revelation. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down. There was something about how she felt Charles had come out of, of the, the Dimbleby interview, that there was a sort of a frankness about that interview that she, she actually quite admired, and she began wondering and talking about whether she should do something herself. My name is Paul Burrell, and I was the butler to Diana, Princess of Wales. Right. I remember the princess telling me, I'd like you to go and pick up somebody at White City. It's a secret. We don't want anybody to know about it. I do remember going in my car to pick up Martin Bashir, and he lie on the back seat of the car, and I covered him with a blanket. No one knew that Martin Bashir was visiting Diana, Princess of Wales, and it was to be kept that way. He was like a small child jumping up the stairs at Kensington Palace. For him, it was so exciting. I thought the princess at that time had very few friends, and she'd now got herself an insider at the BBC, someone that would give her media advice. I didn't think 
that that friendship would ever turn into a major interview. In 1995, Diana's every move was watched by royal handlers, fearful she might once again brief against the future king. Yet by the summer, a small crack had formed in the fortress walls of the royal press machine designed to keep her from scandal. I'm Richard Eyre, and back in the early 90s, I was the BBC's controller of editorial policy. I would have regular meetings with the editor of Panorama. I think it must have been in the early summer of 1995. We had a routine meeting, ran through some programme ideas, and Steve got up to go and he got to the door of my office, I remember, and he turned at the door and he said, oh, by the way, while I'm here, I should just mention Princess Di. And uh, he told me at that time that Martin Bashir, Panorama reporter, thought he had a chance that he might be able to get to meet Princess Diana. I suppose if you could have um, chosen a Panorama reporter most likely to get a scoop uh, uh, on a world scale like this, uh, Martin might have been the last person you would have thought of. But more important than that, I'm just about to share in Leonard's first omelette. And here it comes now. Right, Leonard, thank you very much. Robbie. Martin Bashir was a small fish in a big pond at the BBC. He had done correspondent roles with Songs of Praise, but wasn't very well known at this time. I don't know what he was, actually. What was he? I don't think I, I don't think the editor of Panorama, possibly even Martin, I don't know, ever really thought that there was a chance that she would agree to be interviewed. Part of that is because she was always being approached by journalists, particularly by well-known television journalists, to give an interview. I used to get countless requests for interviews. She had lunched with Clive James frequently, David Frost frequently, and Barbara Walters was a queen bee at the time. And she also put in a bid. I, I would have loved an interview with Diana, obviously, and I suppose in the hopes that that might come about, um, I wrote to her one time. I said, ma'am, if you ever feel that you can uh, put any of this on camera, I'm your woman, I'm here. Diana may already have decided in private she wanted to do some kind of television documentary. But how did Martin Bashir beat his far more famous rivals to the prize of the world's most sought-after interview? I'm Chris Blackhurst. I was a journalist and investigative reporter on The Independent. Very soon after the interview appeared, the, the story about the story uh, really took off. There was no shortage of people who were suspicious of what Martin Bashir had achieved, not least his own colleagues. We were in touch with fellow journalists at the BBC, and this information reached us, reached me, that things might not be quite what they were seeing. According to Blackhurst's investigation, Bashir had initially met Diana's brother, Earl Spencer, to discuss ideas for a potential documentary. Its theme? State surveillance of the royal family. Earl Spencer was suspicious of the security services and the feeling was that people were out to get him or watch him or watch his family. And as Martin Bashir got to know Charles Spencer, was able to fuel uh, this, this suspicion. And he realized as he got further in that he was getting closer and closer to a fantastic prize, which was a sit-down interview with Princess Diana. As discussions developed, Bashir appears to have made a bold claim. Martin Bashir was telling people that he had a source within MI5 who was telling him that the princess was being watched and being followed, etc., etc. I do remember pulling up the floorboards, looking for devices. I unscrewed telephones. The princess always felt that her phones were being tapped. She always felt that she was being listened to. You'll never know how much. 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 The Sun newspapers say this tape is genuine. It records. Just three years earlier, the Sun had disclosed the existence of a recording. 
A supposed phone conversation between Diana and her close friend, James Gilby. The tape recording was almost certainly made by one of our uh, security services and deliberately leaked. The Home Secretary repeatedly rebutted allegations MI5 were involved. No one has produced the slightest serious shred of evidence to support the repeated claim MI5 or any part of the security services are in favor of it. Did Martin play on those fears and prejudices she had? Quite possibly. Frankly, it wasn't something that would have been very difficult. Things got murkier when after the interview, it came to light that Bashir had produced a number of fake documents. The question was why. He went to a graphic artist and they concocted a bank statement. The NatWest Bank, an account in Brighton, apparently belonging to Alan Waller, Charles Spencer's former head of security. The statement showed a payment from a mysterious offshore company. Suspicions were raised that Bashir may have produced these fake documents in order to fuel the princess and her brother's fears, in turn leading to Diana agreeing to the interview. It was felt that Bashir was saying to Charles Spencer at the security services, they are paying Alan Waller for information about you and your sister. After the interview, the BBC launched an investigation. In the end, they didn't deny the statements were fabricated. It wasn't denied at all. They said they were satisfied that they hadn't actually secured the interview, hadn't been shown to Diana and hadn't secured the interview with her. With denials from Bashir and Diana herself apparently confirming she hadn't seen the fake documents, Bashir was exonerated. As for the BBC's explanation as to why the documents had been created, not everyone was convinced. I'm afraid a lot of us blew very loud raspberries at that point. Why would you go to those lengths? Why would you go to the trouble of fabricating a, a bank statement, which is quite a quite a heavy, serious thing to do. Many, however, believe it was another element of Bashir's approach that was the most important factor in securing the interview. The diner I knew wanted to do that program. She was going to do it, whether she'd been shown a, a forged document or not. Secrecy was the key. Martin is not prepared to go down the general accepted a path in order to secure a, a royal interview. I think the princess believed that if any journalist went through the front door of Buckingham Palace, through the established press office procedures, to seek an interview with her, then frankly, that request for an interview would never get to her. Approaches from the high-profile interviewers that went through the filter of the official palace press machine were never successful. Of course, Martin was a secret. No one knew about him. And that was his biggest asset. He hadn't gone through the normal procedure of going through the private secretary's office. He wasn't a celebrity. There was only one celebrity in the interview, and that was Diana. So it was important that if she was going to do an interview, and certainly when she did it with Panorama, it was with a comparative unknown. After weeks of secret meetings with Diana, Bashir's negotiations finally paid off. Things came together suddenly, very rapidly, at the end of October, uh, uh, which led me to make the only one written record that I made of all our discussions. Uh, Steve Hewlett and one of his reporters, that's Bashir, came to see me about a project we've discussed on and off for several months. The outcome of that meeting was that we should proceed full speed ahead. Sorry to be so Delphic, I said at the end of this note. Yet Diana's agreement to the interview had one crucial condition. It must not become known to Buckingham Palace. And what she said was not that she would not give the interview, but that if news of it leaked, she was sure that the palace would find a way to stop the interview. We operated on, it was really corny to say, a need-to-know basis. In the uh, first few weeks, it was literally Martin Bashir and his editor, Steve Hewlett, and Tony Hall, the director of news, then me. By early November, it was about 
seven or eight people, plus, of course, John Burt. John Burt was the BBC's director general, and lots of people didn't like the way he modernised the BBC, and it was difficult to work for. Nonetheless, he was a really tough journalist. Burt quickly gave his backing to the interview. Yet sitting above Burt in the BBC hierarchy was someone unlikely to be quite so approving. The chairman of the BBC governors was Marmaduke Hussey, known as Dukey Hussey, uh, a pillar of the establishment. Appointed by Margaret Thatcher, Hussey, for many, embodied a backward-looking, more deferential vision of the BBC. This had created tensions with his arch-moderniser director-general, John Byrd. Yep, speed me ready. My name is Richard Ayer, and I was for nine years a governor of the BBC. And it was on a, a, a Christmas party just after I joined the BBC. The figure of Marmaduke Hussey, a sort of mammoth man who had lost his leg in Anzio in 1944. He came up to me and said, sit down, sit down over here. And we sat down, him with some difficulty. And he said to me, tell me, um, you know John Burt, don't you? And I said, yes, I do, I do know him. He said, strange fellow, he won't speak to me at all. Not doesn't speak to him, won't speak to him. And he said, would you, um, would you see if you could um, manage to, to, um, to get John to speak to me? So I, I called John the next day, and John said, he's right, I won't speak to him. There's no point, there's just no point. So that was what I discovered I'd walked into. Yet when it came to the Diana interview, it wasn't just the political differences between Hussey and Bert that posed a problem. More critically, Hussey was the husband of Lady Susan Hussey, who was the Queen's senior lady of the bedchamber, lady-in-waiting, in fact, and she's still there today. He would have felt duty-bound to his wife, he would have felt duty-bound to the sovereign to inform the palace that this was actually going ahead. The day that John Burt finally agreed that the interview could go ahead, he took two decisions, one to allow the interview, the other not to tell his chairman. It soured relations between Bert and Hussey, uh, which were not good anyway. It, it soured them irrevocably. This was a moment of real importance for the BBC, a seminal point in the development of its history, a statement of its independence. Here was the most demonstrable way in which the BBC could say, we brought pro broadcast programs that the public should have a right to see and hear. The date finally chosen for the interview was the 5th of November, 1995, the anniversary of the plot to blow up Parliament. The location? Kensington Palace, right under the nose of some of the Queen's closest family. You've got to remember also there were other members of the royal family living there too. The Gloucesters and the Kents that were not far away. I remember well the Sunday the princess said to me, Paul, you haven't had a day off this week. Why don't you go home and play with your children? I thought, odd. Odd that she should just dismiss me. To get past palace security, the small BBC crew devised a cover story. As I understand it, they were introduced by the princess over, over their hi-fi uh, mechanics, technicians. They're going to fit up a new stereo system for me. Perfectly plausible, uh, if you don't know much about hi-fi. To guarantee secrecy, the crew that entered Kensington Palace consisted of just three people. The cameraman, Tony Poole, the producer, Mike Robinson, and Martin Bashir. Tony was left to set up his equipment, leaving Bashir and Diana an hour and a half before filming began. People wonder, had she rehearsed it with Martin Bashir? She obviously hadn't rehearsed it with the BBC. Obviously, Bashir doesn't tell her the questions in advance. Others, however, take a different view. Actually, it had been rehearsed. I know from a later conversation, the princess told me that she had to get it perfect. Internal documents released by the BBC 
state that the princess had been notified in advance of the broad areas of questioning, but not the questions. They knew exactly what the questions would be and how the princess would answer them. And Princess Diana was coached by Martin how to answer the questions. He helped her through the minefield of an interview. The cameraman chose the informal setting of the drawing room and used soft lighting to set the scene for an intimate domestic confession. At around 9 p.m., Bashir and Diana finally sat opposite each other on carefully positioned chairs. The cameraman, Tony Poole, hit record. She wasn't bad, actually, in, in those sort of situations, but she wasn't a natural television performer. Over the 90 minutes of filming, the cameraman recalled that at one key question relating to Diana's alleged lover, James Hewitt, the princess became flustered. Did your relationship go beyond a close friendship? Yes, it did. Yes. Were you unfaithful? She would have been extremely nervous. She knew she'd have to think very fast on her feet. And after some deliberation, Diana arrived on a clever answer. Yes, I adored him. Yes, I was in love with him. The Panorama team were all in our respective homes waiting for that um, uh, phone call. I guess I'd expected it to be early evening and the phone call didn't come and the hours passed and they passed. I think it's fair to say that I got uh, very edgy. It must have been close to midnight when it was Steve Hewlett. He said, they're out, they've got it with them and they've made the backup copy. So that was a moment of great uh, pleasure, frankly. The next morning, I arrived at Kensington Palace. I walked through the drawing room and thought, that's odd. That chair doesn't belong there. And the settee's been moved because I could see with the casters making marks in the carpet. I said to the princess, why all the furniture been moved in the drawing room? Um, I had Jenny for an exercise class. We pushed all the furniture back and, and we did exercising. Really? Yes. You doubt me? I said, no, no reason to. With filming now in the can, plans were made to carry out the edit in a disused BBC building in central London. Yet Panorama editor Steve Hewlett soon raised concerns. He said, mm, I think we've got to move, got to move, got to find somewhere else. And I said, why? He said, it doesn't feel good to me. I think we're being watched. I think the building's being watched. So I said, where do you want to go? And he said, leave it to me. I'll find somewhere. I'll find somewhere. I got a call saying there was a, an editing job in Eastbourne, but they couldn't tell me what it was about, and I'd find out when I arrived. And in fact, I was told not even to tell my wife where I was going. I went to the Grand Hotel where I set up the editing suite. The next day, Mike, the producer, and Martin arrived and handed me a, a pile of tapes and said, we have this for you to edit. So I put in a tape and there was Princess Diana staring out at me. Your Royal Highness, how prepared were you for the pressures that came with marrying into the royal family? At the age of 19, you always think you're prepared for everything. To have her in front of me in an interview was just amazing. I'm a great believer that you should always confuse the enemy. I mean, there was absolutely no way I could possibly have imagined that she would say those things would be so honest in a way about Prince Charles, about the marriage. According to press reports, things became so difficult that you actually tried to injure yourself. Mm. Is that true? Mm. 
When no one listens to you or you feel no one's listening to you, all sorts of things start to happen. And it was just a catalogue of things she felt and it obviously had been bottled up inside her for a long time, which she wanted to uh, share with us all. Or perhaps dig the knife in. It depends on where you look at it, really. <laughs> so I didn't think it would help her, ultimately. But we knew it was going to be dynamite. A few days later, the cut was ready for a first viewing with BBC executives. We had a two-hour journey on the car down to Eastbourne. None of us going to see this film for the first time had any clue what was in it. We didn't know whether she had been um, uh, frank or whether she'd uh, burst into tears. We didn't know whether she'd uh, you know, walked out in anger. We knew nothing about the content. And it was quite important, I think, in retrospect, that we should know nothing about it because our reaction was quite likely to um, uh, forecast the audience reaction. There was no small talk. We were there to see the, the movie and uh, they pressed the play button. During viewings, I sit slightly sideways to see how they react to each answer, each question. I don't think anybody spoke at all throughout that 60 minutes, uh, but there were occasional sharp intakes of breath. So they just couldn't believe what they were seeing on, on screen. It was just, you know, nothing like nothing before whatsoever. Just want to run, run this clip past you. Do you think the Prince of Wales will ever be king? I don't think any of us know the answer to that. And obviously it's a question that's in everybody's head. But who knows? Who knows what fate will produce? Who knows what circumstances will provoke? <laughs> the idea that the line of succession might skip Charles entirely meant that this interview could shake the monarchy to its core. It was clearly going to be extremely embarrassing for the royal family, for the heir to the throne, the future king. So, of course, that was a threat to the whole monarchy. Of course it was. Minutes from a BBC meeting obtained through the Freedom of Information Act revealed that there was very little unused material. All the same, there has long been speculation on what might have been cut. There was one answer which related to the Queen Mother. It was felt to be slightly derogatory, perhaps, and I think it was well known they probably hadn't got on as best friends. I think she just felt maybe she hadn't got the support that she needed. The Queen Mother was obviously a loved person in the country, and, and taking sort of a slight dig didn't seem the right thing to be doing at that time. I don't sit here with resentment. I sit here with sadness because a marriage hasn't worked. The BBC has never released the unedited footage of the interview, including Diana's comments about the Queen Mother. Yet even with this content removed from the final broadcast, the interview remained explosive. Your Royal Highness, thank you. She was good, wasn't she? I haven't seen that for a long time. When the interview was over, the director of BBC News and I go across the road and talk about it ourselves. We didn't say a word until we were on the promenade, leaning on the railings. I think I spoke first and I said, this programme is going to mean either the end of the BBC or the end of the royal family, or possibly both. And there's absolutely no doubt that we have to broadcast it. Once the programme was ready, it was clearly important to get it out pretty quickly because eventually everything leaks. We had right at the beginning, we had agreed that the princess should be allowed to be the person who broke the news to the palace. Diana delivered the news to Robert Fellows, the Queen's private secretary. She said, oh, Robert, I want you to know I've, I've done an interview with the BBC and, and, you know, alarm bells must have rung immediately with Fellows, but, you know, he very generously said, oh, is it something to do with children in need? Her response was no. It was panorama. All the phones started ringing. My mates all sort of calling me, saying, the other royal reporters saying, oh, what's in it, what's in it? I didn't know what was in it. I had no idea. Royal press photographer Mark Saunders 
was on the ground as chaos unfolded in the week leading up to the broadcast. Uh, it was a mad, mad week. First of all, the world's press had descended on London. It was the biggest amount of international press corps I've seen since the Gulf War. With the wait almost over, households up and down the country braced themselves for scandal. There'd been such a build-up over the previous uh, five or six days. I mean, every day there were headlines. So the public interest had been whipped up to fever pitch, really. So 23 million people were going to tune in and watch her give her side of the story. She was nervous, anxious about people's reaction, but clearly being reassured all the time by Martin Bashir that she'd done the right thing and that the film would have the desired impact that she wanted. I can only imagine that she was pent up with anticipation, probably anxiety. You've got to remember, at the time, people were watching it in pubs. I mean, it was, it was a massive event. And yet you can't control other people's reactions, so it's like the entire nation's opinion of you is hanging in the balance. And it always boils down to either you believe the woman or you don't. Tonight on Panorama, the Princess of Wales. At Buckingham Palace, the press office team watched in horror. I was with my colleagues in the press office. And we were all gobsmacked about what was coming out, angry about what was coming out. There was a lot of colourful language. I would have never been backward in coming forward when it comes to colourful language. Do you really believe that a campaign was being waged against you? Yes, I did, absolutely. Yeah. Why? Mm, I was a uh, separated wife of the Prince of Wales. I was a problem, full stop. Never happened before. What do we do with her? I was kind of outraged because she was making accusations that just simply were not true. She was pointing a finger at the Prince of Wales as being the culprit or his office, stopping her doing things. I couldn't believe that she had gone public with every aspect of her, her private life, really, right down to her adultery and her love for Hewitt and her feelings about Camilla. What evidence did you have that their relationship was continuing even though you were married? A, a woman's instinct is a very good one. <laughs> It was splash after splash after splash. As I watched it, I was absolutely aware that this is an extraordinary piece of television, and practically every sentence was staggering. Your Royal Highness, thank you. At the BBC, the news team gathered to celebrate their triumph. After the programme was finished, we opened at least one bottle of cheap white wine, and so my recollection of the detail is uh, hazy, to put it mildly. After the Diana interview, there's an immediate reaction point. Newsnight, quite rightly, are devoting their entire programme to the sensational interview. Nicholas Soames, you're a good friend of Prince Charles. Presumably he was sitting watching it tonight. What do you think he'll have made of it? Well, I have no idea, and I certainly couldn't um, possibly speak for the Prince of Wales. But uh, for my own part, as uh, an interested observer, I find some of it to be uh, toe-curlingly dreadful. It actually makes my skin crawl even now because the immediate reaction from so many establishment commentators was totally medieval. It really is uh, the sort of advanced stages of paranoia. So she's made it all up. She's I, paranoid. I, I've simply no idea, but it seems to me like the advanced stages of paranoia. If you want to trash a woman, say she's mad. It's a really powerful allegation and there's no way of defending yourself against it because if you sit there and go, no, I'm not mad at all, I'm not mad, you look like you're mad. I have no doubt that lots of people listened to Nicholas Soames's comment and thought, yeah, I bet she is really mad and paranoid and so that's just my excuse to hate her even more in a really classic way that's unchanged since 
antiquity. Most of the coverage centred on Diana's revelations, especially her admission of adultery, and then moved to the British public's reaction. Diana was annoyed that she'd mentioned James Hewitt because I don't think she'd foreseen that that was going to be the strongest story for the tabloids. She had wanted a much more uh, rounded uh, res response to the interview. The press was almost uniformly hostile to her. I got the feeling when talking to her that she was wondering whether she had miscalculated. I remember the princess saying to me, what do you think the queen will say? She would see the fallout from this. I had lunch with the queen not long after, and she said to me, unprompted, how are things at the BBC? And I said, oh, well, fine. She said, frightful thing to do, frightful thing that my daughter-in-law did. The marriage problems of Charles and Diana have cast a shadow over the royal family. Now the Queen has decided to bring the whole issue to a head by advising them to divorce. In the interview, Diana had been clear that she herself had no such desire. Would it be your wish to divorce? No, it's not my wish. Why? Wouldn't that resolve matters? Why would it resolve matters? Her greatest fear is that her boys would be taken away from her. She says they're going to do that, you know. They're going to try and take my boys away from me. There was uh, a letter from the Queen uh, to both Charles and Diana saying, um, enough is enough. Get on to your lawyers and start divorce proceedings. That was the price she paid for the Panorama interview. Piece by piece, Diana had demolished the fairy tale fantasy that had once been her prison. Many in both the establishment and the media had punished her for revealing a more complex reality. What above all we have a right to expect of royalty is a degree of reticence, a degree of dignity. But on the streets, another story was unfolding. I suppose she'll get quite a lot of support from it. She does come across as if she's been done wrong by the prince. She needed to do something. She needed to put her side of the story um, for us to hear. You know, I, I think it's right that she's done it. It's the public reaction to Panorama that counts. It's not the newspapers, the columnists, the Wednesday witches, and all those people who write nasty things about her in, in, in the daily papers and the Sunday papers. It was the public, and the public loved it. I think everything has uh, a lot to do with, with what Diana said about her own mental well-being. I was unwell with postnatal depression, which no one ever discusses postnatal depression. You have to read about it afterwards. She did wear her heart on her sleeve. You couldn't really imagine anyone else in the royal family using the kind of language Diana used in Panorama. She'd wake up in the morning feeling you didn't want to get out of bed, uh, you felt misunderstood. The risk of talking about mental health during the 90s was high. It was very easy to get labels attached to people who were vocal and... For Diana to talk so openly and so confidently about postnatal depression was a breakthrough. It meant that women all over the country and the world were looking around and actually being able to relate, not to a princess, but to a mother. Friends on my husband's side were indicating that I was, again, unstable, um, sick, and should be put in an, a home of some sort in order to get better. I was almost an embarrassment. In just a few days after Panorama, Diana received some 6,000 letters of support from women identifying with her plight. Diana told me afterwards, after Panorama, she, she had people coming up to her in the street saying, oh, thank goodness you, you've talked about that, you're unhappy, marriage, you, and you're out of it, now I'm going to do the same. And I think she had given women quite a lot of strength to speak up if they were unhappy. They were going their separate ways today as the Prince of Wales left Kensington Palace, the princess drove in. So the marriage is now absolutely finished. That is the end of it. That is the end. The marriage is now finished in five months, yes. Panorama had left Diana with a divorce she claimed she never wanted. 
It was a moment when it may have felt as if everything she'd sought to achieve with the interview had failed. Yet she would soon find that in the long run, it would transform her reputation. The Panorama interview was a platform and a springboard into another dimension. And that's what Panorama did for her. She was no longer shopping on Sloane Street and lunching in Belgravia. All of a sudden, she was rubbing shoulders with the likes of Bill Clinton. And she finally got the credibility that I think she craved. And at Diana's side, as she negotiated this new world, was an old ally. In terms of the personal relationship that she had um, developed with Martin Bashir, it didn't end when he packed away his camera equipment and he and his crew left Kensington Palace. He became a constant visitor and support to her for many months. He began helping her with her public addresses, with her speeches. In the wake of Panorama, Many of Diana's critics claimed she'd been used by Bashir in a way she'd come to regret. Yet her continuing alliance with the journalist suggests a very different possibility. I'm Judy Jones. I'm an author and a body language expert. The thought that Diana was bullied into this interview by Martin Bashir makes me laugh, quite frankly. She was so in control of herself, so in control of her emotions, and also so in control of the entire interview. She was steering, guiding. He would ask a question, the eyes would go to the left, and she would breathe in slightly. Is that true? But then very quickly she'd come back without any faltering whatsoever with a pitch-perfect answer. Well, the enemy was my husband's department because I always got more publicity. With apparently conflicting accounts, there's no way of knowing for sure whether the interview was rehearsed. Yet detailed analysis of Diana's performance drops some intriguing hints. Those giveaways to me implied that there probably had been some form of collusion about what the questions were going to be and then she was given time maybe to work out what her answers were going to be. Panorama wasn't spontaneous. Um, I mean, some of the things she said I, I had already heard. I met Diana for a long, long chat, five months before Panorama, just the two of us. And the, these are notes from June 95. And she says there were always, from day one, three people in the marriage. She means Camilla. Well, there were three of us in this marriage. So it was a bit crowded. Now that's one of the most famous phrases from Panorama. So it was something that was going through her head, you know, months before. Oh, there's so much here, there's pages and pages of it. What was your reaction to your husband's disclosure that he had in fact committed adultery? Well, I, I was totally unaware of the content of the book and actually saw it on the news that night that it would come out. Part of the plan was to not look overly vindictive. There's a phrase in Shakespeare that I didn't come to praise Caesar, I came to bury him. And I think what she does, and this is a good example with Charles, is she buries him by praising him. But then I admired the honesty, because it takes a lot to do that. In what sense? Well, to be honest about um, a relationship with someone else in his position is quite something. Diana's physical appearance also played a powerful part in guiding the audience response. She'd use what looked like a white pencil under the rim of the eyes to make them look even sadder. The look is somebody who appears to have put on makeup in a way that is concealing her distress. It's like somebody who has been very, very tearful and then run out of a room, uh, come back 10 minutes later, uh, having restored their, their makeup. I think that's a conscious decision. And I think that she presented herself as a victim. That's not being cunning, it's not being calculating, it's survival. The artfulness of the appearance of, of spontaneity, that's, that's acting, that is very considerable. But at the same time, doesn't mean that what she was acting wasn't true. Diana's performance may have borne all the hallmarks of something skillfully rehearsed, but it wasn't simply a bid to get even. It was also part of a job pitch. What role do you see for yourself in the future? 
I'd like to be an ambassador for this country. I'd like to represent this country abroad. In 1997, Diana put her ambitions into action with trips to Angola and Bosnia to promote a ban on landmines. But many in the establishment were skeptical. Can I get you to introduce your name? Charles Crawford. I was ambassador to Bosnia. And in 1997, I hosted Diana there when she came out on her visit. It was politically sensitive. Yes, it's clear that this category of weapon was getting, had been used in a, you know, an indiscriminate and improper way, for sure, in, in these wars. But doing something about that and having a treaty which is watertight so you can make sure that other people aren't cheating is a, is a job for grown-up diplomacy. Fortunately for Diana, Britain's new Prime Minister, Tony Blair, appeared keen to support her ambitions. He later admitted that he had explicitly discussed with Diana a special role as an overseas ambassador. It would have been the culmination of everything Diana had sought to achieve with Panorama. Yet the interview had also set in motion another set of forces that would soon have far darker consequences. Well, of course, Panorama made her even more sensational. She had given this interview that everybody was talking about. Of course, press attention, public attention, uh, went stratospheric. I never know where a lens is going to be. A normal day would come back to my car and find six freelance photographers jumping around me. By the summer of 1997, the pressure on Diana in the wake of Panorama reached a peak. When the press got wind of the fact that she was um, on, on a yacht in South France and that she was having a bit of a fling with Mohammed El Fayed of, of, of Harrod's uh, son, Dodi, the, the hunt was on. Quite simply, it was a media frenzy. Those 44 days, that was every single day. Massive press coverage. It was just snowballed. You kind of got the feeling that where is this going to end? I found the experience of this interview to be very emotional. I didn't expect it. People don't understand how difficult it is to do an interview. How to project yourself and your emotion through that little square box. It's kind of, I suppose, the, in a religious sense, it's like confession. You're aware that everything you're saying is being recorded and it's there for posterity. Inside St. James's Palace, Princess Diana's coffin lay in the peace and privacy of the Chapel Royal, as all day outside the crowds of people waiting to pay their last respects built up. Did the Panorama interview play a big part in the public response to her death? Unquestionably, it did. I think that she was a celebrity victim, and I think she came through it, and that was a good example to a lot of people. People who'd never met her, but people who had remembered her words in the Panorama program, wanted to be there to show their respect for her. She only gave this one interview. She never gave another uh, 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 interview of substance. Audiences probably came to believe that they knew Diana in a way that they didn't know other members of the royal family uh, and hadn't known her before Panorama. After her death, a single phrase from Panorama came to define the princess. She was the queen of people's hearts, and what had happened to her was, it wasn't time. She regretted using the, the phrase queen of hearts. She says that, that was a dreadful mistake. But that's the phrase, obviously, people remember from Panorama more than anything else. I think ordinary people understood that here is a woman who is on a journey. 
She's on a journey from being the obedient woman to being the slandered woman to being what should have been the fulfilled, self-actualized woman. And her death cut that narrative short. But in fact, she had triggered something, and um, her death changed everything. Of course it did. And good evening, you're all very welcome to the show. Gary Barlow, everybody! <laughs> Princess Diana's interview was a real watershed in lots of ways. With the generation that follows, no one laughs at talking about mental ill health. I put on a lot of weight in that period, a lot of depression. At first, you look back on those times and you go, but it was all right, really. But then when you look again, you go, actually, there's some quite serious issues. Yeah. It's not weak to talk about your emotions. It's actually strong. It's seen as something that celebrities should be doing. And in fact, we're actually suspicious of people who don't behave like Princess Diana anymore. I just want to hug you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Mental health has always been a bit of a stigma, hasn't it? Now, everybody talks about it. Why? Really, because William and Harry have. We have seen time and time again that unresolved mental health problems lie at the heart of some of our greatest social challenges. And why have William and Harry done that? Because she did it first. She did it first with all that she's saying, really, in Panorama. I do things differently because I don't go by a rule book, because I lead from the heart, not the head. We like to be as emotionally connected and verbal, but now it is incredibly open. open. And if you want to be mean about it, you can say, oh, well, you know, it's all touchy-feely and we're all fragile millennial snowflakes and we can't talk about anything without talking about how we suffer. The world is getting too offended by everything, too sensitive, too snowflakey. Let's just get a grip. Feelings are very important, but thinking and being sort of disciplined and tough and wise and measured and, and smart are also part of it as well. It's easy to, to look at this more accepting world that we have now and think it was always that way. I've had suicidal thoughts in the past. You know, I've, I've kind of, I've been there. You Big talk thing, and it? talking's really good and yeah. it helps you overcome so many yeah. things. But there's also the possibility that people may start coming forward claiming victimhood when actually, by any normal standard of historical experience, they have literally nothing to complain about. We must but I think being candid about the good stuff and the bad stuff is a really good thing. All the things that we laughed at Princess Diana for in 1995 have really become the norm. It will say something good for people who are now gonna grow up in a much more emotionally articulate world.